What got you into infectious disease as a specialty? You know, I did it as a third year med- fourth year medical student. The rotation I wanted to do was um, filled, and I looked. I had to do something, so I'll try infectious diseases because at the time I was heading to family practice, uh-huh. and I did it, and I was hooked. I mean, it was so much fun, and the cases were so cool, and the attendings uh, were just the greatest people, uh, and they all share a characteristic that all ID doctors have, which is a love of the sound of their own voice. So I thought, this is the field for me. And so I never looked back. And so it's sort of one of those uh, rare epiphanies where you actually, I actually had a, a life-changing event, and uh, I've had a blast ever since. Almost by accident. Yeah, it was by accident. Well, what is it about chiropractic and other alternative medicine modalities that have has you really concerned? Uh, basically, it, depending on the one and depending on what you're talking about, most are not based in reality and most don't work. And um, I think that patients and sick people should have therapies that are based in reality. And some things like, say, homeopathy are so far from reality that it boggles the mind or reeky. And it should be based on things that are shown to be effective. Because people's lives and health and their um, um, finances are dependent upon that. And so I think we have an obligation to give people medicine that works. The financial aspect is one that I, I don't think I heard much until listening to you and then also reading uh, Edzard Ernst's book, Trigger yeah. Treatment. And that definitely gave me a different perspective because in chiropractic we talk about, oh, you know, adjustments are so much cheaper than being on all of these prescriptions. But it really depends on how you look at it. An adjustment can, you know, 60 bucks a pop oftentimes is what people charge. Uh, Pun intended. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Compared to, you know, a bottle of ibuprofen or some other painkiller. Oh, yeah. And for serious illnesses, I mean, I bankrupt people all the time. Seriously, people come in without insurance, they have a serious infection that I have to treat, and by the time they're done, they're permanently bankrupted. And, you know, in the outpatient setting, you used, we're all used to seeing the results of minor problems. But if minor problems progress, they can lead to major problems, which devastate people financially, emotionally, uh, health, healthily. <laughs> <laughs> But these things are very expensive and they mount up very quickly and you lose track when you're a provider as to just how much this stuff can cost people that they can't afford often. Even simple things. I, my brother didn't have insurance for a while and was having some pain in his upper left quadrant. Someone suggested maybe it's your spleen, maybe it's something else. And uh, so we went to the ER. They said, no, you just have the flu. Here's Tylenol. And the bill came back for like five, six hundred dollars. Oh, yeah. You know, And just really even that small amount relative relatively small amount really hurt him yeah financially. now you do deal mostly with those more severe cases right yeah i'm mostly that's... yeah i'm 99 percent inpatient medicine mm-hmm. i have very little outpatient medicine so i obviously have a skewed perspective on on health care i only take care of very sick people in the hospital rarely i don't have much of an outpatient practice for a variety of reasons how do you think that that skews your perspective on alternative medicine? Oh, yeah, it definitely does because I don't take care of those people who have the problems that no one can figure out and for which there are no therapies, like chronic fatigue syndromes, for example, which um, you know people suffer from. I see them occasionally, uh, but people with chronic problems that have minimal effective therapies and especially don't have a cause. I don't deal with those. And that's a whole realm of medicine that is extremely difficult um, to know how to treat and what to do. I see the occasional chronic fatigue patient, uh, but um, um, you know, it's not part of my existence. I, and then I see about infectious diseases, of course, is you find the bug, you kill it, the patient's better. You know, me find bug, me kill bug, me go home. It's a simple, <laughs> it's a simple job. So it does skew you because I'm used to figuring it out, fixing it, getting it better, and moving on. And a lot of outpatient medicine is chronic illness, which I recognize, and I don't deal with that. So my skill set is suboptimal for treating chronic, unremitting, undiagnosable diseases. And it seems that that's what a lot of patients that go to alternative medicine therapies are trying to find a cure for. 
because uh, nothing, nothing else has worked. Yeah, you know, I think there's as many reasons that people use alternative medicines as there are people. I mean, some people, because they have a, a, a problem that doesn't get better, some people are just cantankerous contrarians who doesn't want the man to tell them what to do, you know, and so they do it that way. Or there's fear, like anti-vaccine people, uh, a, a complete misunderstanding of vaccines. So I don't, I, I actually have never figured out why, even though I read the literature, why people go seek alternative providers as a general rule, I can only speak as to why a patient goes to a given provider. This is pretty, um, pretty variable. Yeah, I started. I'm always surprised sometimes at the people who do. Are you? Why is that? I just think you know they don't have a problem that needs something. You know, they they are on therapy, but they add on other things that don't add much but expense. You know, they have an infection, so they take colloidal silver. Well, that's not going to help you. It's just going to turn you blue. Um, and so um, things like that. Now, you you spend a lot of time in your podcast, at least, addressing chiropractic, acupuncture, um, the professions in general yeah. that are based around alternative medicine. In undergrad, I had a cold and went to the doctor, and I was given by a medical doctor a homeopathic drug. That kind of surprised me. It was surprising. Oh. <laughs> In the immortal words of Gag Hellfront, you know, doctors are just this guy, you know? I don't know if you're a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, uh, no, fan. it's not the movie, sorry. Uh, uh, if you ever get a chance, uh, download the BBC original television or uh, radio show. Mm -hmm. It's hilarious. Uh, but d doctors are no different, unfortunately or fortunately, than anybody else. So they're as prone to all the problems that the non-physician is for alternative medicine. Unfortunately, medical school training does not teach you how to think. It teaches you what to think. And you're used to that. You're doing your basic science years, right? Mm -hmm. Are you totally inundated with an unbelievable amount of information that there's no way you're going to stuff it into your brain? Yeah. And yeah. anytime I raise my hand and ask the question, well, wait a minute, what about this? There's no time for that right now. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that doesn't end. And by the time you're done with your training, which is basically stuffing information into your brain and learning how to do your job, then you have your practice, which again, very time consuming. And, uh, and so people never get time to think critically about stuff. So a doctor uses homeopathy. Uh, the average physician is no better trained than anyone else for evaluating those things. So, yeah, it doesn't surprise me. That leads me to two questions. First of all, if it's then the doctor that perhaps is uneducated in a certain area, why, why address the profession as a whole? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, why go after acupuncture or, or talk about... I don't know. It's just I find it <sighs> the guiding force for virtually every aspect of my life is to do what I find interesting. Mm -hmm. Now I don't know why I find these things interesting, but you know I tell my kids this: figure out what you enjoy and what you like, and run with it, and you'll be happier long run. So I just find the I thought the whole issue of skepticism and how people think badly and how people think and. Uh, why people think is just for me an interesting area. And people say, well, why don't you go after big pharma? Or why don't you talk about, uh, I got a recent um, email about, oh, you should uh, uh, write about uh, 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 physical therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's just, it doesn't interest me. <laughs> I don't know why. It's just, I do the things that I find interesting. And I find those issues interesting. I get that. I agree. I find. This idea of evidence-based medicine, wherever it may be, really fascinating. And when I read trick or treatment, as much as it is completely against acupuncture and homeopathy and you know these things that I'm learning a bit about, it fascinates me the stories behind how oh, yeah. how uh, clinical trials came about and and as you mentioned, how we think and how we can be how we can fool ourselves. Oh yeah. It really is amazing. So if you don't, okay, so so you just talking in general terms about chiropractic because that's what's out there, uh, rather than talking about specific practices or specific doctors that do specific treatments that may not have evidence behind them. 
Yeah. And, you know, it's in, from my mind, I've come to this conclusion over the time. It's not the person. It's the, it's not the sin. It's not the sinner. It's the sin <laughs> mm. to quote the Pope. I think the Pope said that. Um, I'm not, it's, it's not the individual doing something. It's the overall, uh, milieu that is changing. Cause it doesn't matter if I make say, you know, Dr. Oz suddenly decides that, uh, uh, green coffee beans don't cause weight loss. It's the overall environment where people are not thinking critically about medicine or other important issues. Um, that's important. So I've, I've kind of drifted away from the person over the years. It's more the concepts that, that mm -hmm. I try and talk about. Is it the process of evaluating a treatment? Is that where, where you think a lot of doctors yeah. go wrong? So what is your process? Yeah, in, in understanding... Well, I only you start. I like to start at the basics, and so you know, what's the plausibility that something's going to work? Uh, you know, will this given antibiotic has efficacy in the test tube? So it should work for this weird infection I got. You know, and then you look for animal studies and clinical trials that show also efficacy. But for a lot of it, you like to know that it works at a fundamental level, that it makes sense at a fundamental level before you start applying it to people. And some things have make no sense at a fundamental level, like acupuncture or homeopathy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're not their fundamental basis is fantasy. It kind of depends on your on your perspective, your paradigm, because Reiki, and I've, I've taken courses in Reiki, and I'm, I've received my attunement. I do not practice Reiki. But for those who believe in energy, believe in this aura, believe in this spirit being that can be affected by another person's energy, there's plausibility. Yeah, but there is no energy. And if you could, I mean, I've always said, it's been pointed out by others, if we can pick up a the power of a of a uh, refrigerator light bulb, which is what the uh, uh, Voyager spacecraft is transmitting. So it's out past Pluto. It's giving out energy at the level of a refrigerator light bulb, and we can pick it out. Now, I'm a little biased that way. My undergrad degree all back in the last century was physics. Mm -hmm. So I spent my days you know, working on what energy is, and I'm nowhere near the knowledge base I had back then. But there is no energy, and there is no... Uh, energy that you or I can alter in each other. It does not exist. Now, this always gets down to how you know something works or not. And the problem with medicine is that it runs counterintuitive to everything we do every day. What's the best burger place in Portland? Oh, uh, I haven't, I don't eat very many burgers, but I haven't found a good one. Where do you like to go? Well, I mean, I like um, Little Big Burger. Okay. Why? Well, because I tried a bunch of different burgers over the years, and I think it's the best burger. Uh -huh. What's your favorite beer? Well, I like ESBs and IPAs. I like hoppy beers. I'm a Portlander. How do I know? Because I've tried a bunch of different beers, and it works for me. Um, and that's how – what's are my favorite shoes? I always wear Merrells. Why? Because mm -hmm. I've tried a bunch of other shoes, and they're the most comfortable for my daily walk. And that's how we approach everything every day is what worked for us and – what people tell us. And what's counterintuitive about all medicine is a cannot use that to determine what works for you. And there's so much that goes into fooling yourself that something is effective that um, you can't trust it. And I always say the three most dangerous words in medicine are in my experience mm -hmm. when it comes to therapeutic interventions because you can't trust yourself. How do we, how do we control that or how do we prevent ourselves from fooling ourselves? Well, first is knowledge and understanding how you can fool yourself. And the other is, you know, that's why we have randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind trials. So you take out all the potential bias that could possibly go into determining if something works. I mean, I love the acupuncture stuff is, the, I think, the most compelling uh, for that showing bias because once you remove any knowledge that the patient is getting acupuncture, then it works just as well as real acupuncture. So twirling toothpicks on the skin, if the patient thinks it's acupuncture, is the same as acupuncture mm -hmm. for relief of, what was it, knee pain or back pain? I think the German study was knee pain. So if twirling toothpicks works just as well as real acupuncture, then you know acupuncture does nothing. Hmm. If, if something is equal to a fake procedure, that doesn't work. But the act of Inter not interfering. Oh, God, I'm getting old. 
uh, having a relationship with a patient has innumerable effects beyond just what you do. Here's your prescription, you have to take your appendix out, whatever. I mean, I'm very aware of how much those social interactions are very important in changing perspective as to how you hurt. When you tell a patient you have an unusual disease and you're not certain, and you just tell them, I'm not certain, but it's not cancer. Ah, you should see the relief on their face. Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, I just made right there a huge difference in how they're going to approach stuff. They know it's not cancer. If you're having an intervention with someone, you will always have lots of effects that are not non-specific effects. They're very important. And most of alternative medicine is having those non-specific effects effects and feeling better and that's a good thing it's just being done under false pretenses right so we're, we're talking about a form of the placebo effect if what if the only benefit you get is the placebo effect so if you're using acupuncture or homeopathy and the patient does get better maybe it's only because of your interaction and having someone with confidence that makes them feel better yeah and that's why they get better yeah is that a bad thing? Well, in current medical practice, doing something specifically for placebo is considered to be unethical. So the, one of the key concepts in medical ethics is the patient has to be informed as to what you're doing and the risks and the benefits. They're the boss. And if you're doing a placebo, if, if you're doing it for placebo and you're not telling the patient up front, there's no effort, there's no sign, there's no ther there's no evidence to show that X works, it's a, it's a worthless therapy, um, and I'm going to do it anyway, which nobody ever does, um, then you're doing placebo ethically. But if you're not doing it without informed consent, you're not doing it ethically. And placebo outside of clinical trials is considered unethical in modern medicine. Even if you have to lie. It's better. The ends don't justify the means. Of, is that the right one? Uh-huh. Yeah. No, because you're not allowed to lie to your patient. And it, by omission I, or commission. I get that. And I'm a lousy liar. Yeah. So when I think ahead, you know, yeah, I've, I know that this treatment has been experienced to work, has been observed to work, maybe not in a controlled trial. But yeah, a doctor does this and the patients get better. The Latin doctors are really, uh, a really nice guy, makes their patients feel really comfortable. I have to wonder, is that all that's going on? And could I... Tell the patient, you know, this this therapy doesn't have an effect, but I'm going to do it anyway because you're going to feel better. That would probably be an ethical way to do it. Yeah, it would be interesting that they'd want to pay money for that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's say I just spent an hour. You're doing something that doesn't work, and you're doing it anyway, and I'm giving you $120. I don't think that's going to go over real well. <laughs> But placebo medicine is not um, considered ethical in this society. You're not that's allowed true. to lie to your patients ever by omission or commission. Is that a consensus of – just a general consensus of doctors? Yeah. You know, there's – if you go – no, it's, it's the official guidelines of ethics. I mean I haven't – if you go to the Wikipedia page on medical ethics, they go through the the main points of medical ethics, one of which is that the patient – is the boss and has to be informed about what you're doing. Um, honestly, you got to tell them what you're going to do and why. And there's always, I mean, you always, how you choose to tell people things always biases them and you have to be careful about that. You know, if you tell them you have a 50% chance of dying, they're going to be a lot worse than if you say you have a 50% chance of living. Mm. I mean, how you phrase things is very important. And you have to do it honestly with people. But uh, those interactions have a lot of power uh, with people. And you have to be honest with people. And that's the hard part of medicine. Getting back to the uh, controlled trials and, and sham versus real treatments, we try to figure this out a lot in chiropractic. How can you do a sham adjustment? How could you double blind a chiropractic treatment? I don't know. I haven't read on that one. I haven't read, uh, yeah, that's not something that I have read in or on, so I can't answer that. Usually yeah. clever people can come up with something that fools people, but I don't know if that's ever been invented. The best idea I have is to take a full term of students, teach them sham adjustment with them thinking that it's real, and then let them go out and practice and see what happens. But I don't think that would go over very well. 
No. Something similar was done, uh, which I've always found fascinating, was this guy, I forget his name, he was a palm reader. Mm. And he got this amazing results with all his palm reading. And then he started giving the opposite reading of everything he saw and got the exact same effects from the people he talked to. Who was that? <laughs> but I think that's <laughs> – I always thought that was fascinating how you can convince people. You say, I, he, everything he saw, he told the opposite. And he got the same encouragement from his, his uh, patients, victims. I don't know, whatever word you'd use for someone who'd use to a palm reader. Yeah, there's an interesting study that we talked about recently on idiopathic effects. Um, I think it's idiopathic. Uh, no, it's a different word. Uh, idiomotor, where your subconsciously you control what you do what your yeah, the Ouija does. board kind of, yeah the Ouija board and so there was a doctor and I I want to say it was here in Portland but I'm not sure that did a, a similar trial and brought people in and showed them um, uh, the water dowsing rods showed them the you know the the medallion hanging over the, the palm and if it goes in a circle that's a yes if it goes in a straight line that's a no and these people came up and tried it and it worked. The yes was yes, the yeah. no was no. But then he had a whole different cohort come in and he said, well, if it goes in a straight line, that's a yes. And if it goes in a circle, that's a no. So he flipped it around, but the same results. Yeah, fascinating stuff. Really fascinating how that happens. Have you ever yeah. been to a chiropractor? No. Will you ever consider going to one? I can't think of why. Yeah. I don't have back. I don't have back. Oh, I did. Actually, I had a C-spine disc for about nine months. That was miserable. But uh, eventually it got fixed the old-fashioned way with a knife. Oh, really? Yeah. Under surgery. Yeah. Best day of my life was when I woke up without any cervical radiculopathy. You cannot imagine how good it feels. <laughs> I've had a lot of medical problems in my life, but the one I have sympathy for patients more than any other is nerve root pain. Mm -hmm. It's there all the time. It's miserable. It never gets better. I could never take narcs for it because I was working. So yeah. I could and it's just uh don't want to be you know, Dr. House, yeah. Oh no. Nine months of misery until it got so bad they fixed it. And when I woke up pain free. <sighs> but I don't think I'd ever go. I don't see a reason why I would need to. Mm -hmm. Do you talk much with chiropractors? Have you ever interviewed one or or discussed how they practice? Uh, yes, on and off over the years. Yeah. Usually it's in social situations where you're polite and you don't want to cause a fuss. <laughs> you know, I mean... That's I, my it's, favorite place to cause a fuss. Yeah, it's not mine. I mean, yeah. you know, like right now, we, you and I are having a, a civil conversation and I have no... I honestly have no uh, urge to be an asshole. I mean... <laughs> Well, <laughs> I mean, you can. You can be aggressive and, and belligerent, and it serves no useful purpose. It's fun to write that way. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, there's a great deal of fun in coming up with a clever way to say something written. But when I'm talking to people, I mean, we have a different approach in the world, I'm sure, and that's fine. I'll be happy to talk with you, and I'm always going to be civil and nice. That's how I tend to try and be. Your writing and, is your writing is very aggressive. Yeah. You don't pull any punches and it's very to the point. No. And, you know, if you ask me a direct question, I'll give you a direct answer, but I'm going to be nice about it because mm. I like to get along with people. But no, I'd never go to a chiropractor. I don't have a need to. And I don't think it would work. And if I had low back pain, it would probably help. But, you know, I would probably just do the conservative thing of nothing and lie on my back and take some time because most get better. Regression to the mean. Yeah. If chiropractic could help with that quicker, would that be enough reason? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if there What's are any studies that show that show the time frame yeah, when boy. it goes away. I haven't read that for a while. It's been a couple of years, so it's kind of faded. My memory is that it's as good as other modalities for relieving low back pain. But I have to admit, I'm a, my uh, my uh, uh, it's been a while since I've read it. And the only stuff I can keep active in my brain is infectious disease stuff. Mm. But yeah, I mean, if I thought I could get me better faster, I'd go. But, I mean, I always worry about uh, 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 the very real complications of, of uh, someone messing with my spine. 
I mean, it seems to me that things are set up. Okay, relax, relax, relax. There, let's uh, rupture of a tebal artery. Now, I know that the chiropractic literature denies that that is a problem. But my reading of the literature suggests that, especially with neck stuff, uh, people do get vertebral tears occasionally after this. It seems I wouldn't take the risk for what would be marginal benefit for something that would be popping my spine. Is that risk as great as the as the risk of iatrogenic, you know, fatalities in the hospital? I just found another article yesterday yeah. that numbered it at four hundred thousand a year. Deaths are caused by medical treatment. Oh yeah, I mean, I sit on our quality council, and I'm very proud of the work we've done to decrease complications and deaths. And in my my uh, my hospital system, we all. Oh, since doing a lot of science and evidence-based interventions, we estimate in the system we have prevented over the recent numbers like 250 deaths over the last five years and over 1,000 infections mm -hmm. by doing all these quality interventions. Medicine is dangerous, and I'm the first to admit that. Uh, but also, it's always a matter – it's not the absolute risk of – the danger, but it's the risk versus the benefit. You come in with an acute heart attack, what we're going to do to you is dangerous and risky and could kill you. But it's a hell of a lot better than staying at home with your big heart attack. If you come in with a dissecting aneurysm, you're in a world of hurt. If you don't treat it, you're dead. If you go into the hospital, you can get into serious problems from what we do with you, but the risk is greater than the benefit. Uh, if you have alternative modalities that are equal to chiropractic with less risk, just going to a physical therapist and having a massage, um, I go with that, even though it's a tiny risk. Hmm. And yeah, hospitals I, are dangerous places. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I try to avoid them as much as I can. Oh, yeah. I'm in them all day. I know what we can do to people. Uh, but I also know all the things we do to prevent things from happening. Yeah. But it's not just – it's just not the absolute death you have to bear in mind. It's the benefit you – gain from dealing with very dangerous medical conditions. And I think we're, at least in my school, we talk about those risks as well. But the numbers that are thrown out are one in about a million adjustments, yeah. cervical adjustments cause vertebral artery dissection. And is, is that a large enough risk? Well, what's the benefit? I wonder if it depends on, on what you're treating. Yeah. I mean, having seen big strokes in young people, how devastating it is. There are things I would not take a one in a million risk for. Mm. I wouldn't take a brain insult as a one in a million risk. You know, it just doesn't you know. I remember the one I saw as a girl who overstretched in her yoga class. And as she was overstretching, she tore her vertebral artery. Oh, and it really? Was, yeah, it was a devastating, devastating um, um, problem. If the risk was, uh, was you know, a little headache, yeah. Uh, but strokes, man, if you take care of a couple of those, you know, there's there's certain diseases that no that you don't want to ever have to have as a doctor because you've seen how devastating and brain insults are just not on my to do list. It's not well, worth the risk. The benefit that many chiropractors claim is that upper cervical adjustments can can correct many different issues from indigestion to allergies to well dd palmer yeah adjusted the cervical neck to cure deaf deafness according to the story yeah that's uh, that's an uh, interesting story <laughs> and i don't know how like if you could tell me how adjusting the neck could cure deafness as a basic principles i would be interested i would too i'm hoping some listeners can can shed some light yeah, on that because uh, it's like and many of these alternative medicines have very interesting uh, origin stories kind of like you know comic books and you know you get bit by a radioactive spider or you see that a bird has a broken wing and something an owl and then you see that something in its eye oh look there's the birth of iridology and ear acupuncture started because somebody's back pain got better after they um uh uh burned their ear and he, came, right. and he came up with ear acupuncture as a consequence. Uh, these don't seem to have a lot of basic principles to guide them, if you ask me. I would love to know how, how adjusting the neck could cure deafness. Um, or even if that's true. I don't know. Is that really a true story or is that apocryphal? 
You know, it's <laughs> it's repeated so often. The yeah. the only variation that I heard on it was a version in which Dee Dee Palmer didn't invite the janitor in and and have this hypothesis of if I adjust here, something might change. Yeah. But rather, the janitor was a joke teller, and he loved conversing with the other tenants in the building. And Dee Dee was reading a big, heavy anatomy book and went out and listened to a great joke that uh, that the janitor told. And as he was laughing, Dee Dee slapped him on the back and said, "That was a that was a good one." And that's when the janitor heard a pop in his neck, and the next day was able to hear through that ear again. That's the only other version that I've heard. Ha, I never um, heard that one. I don't think many people are going to agree with that. That that's yeah. that's true. So there. Uh, there are a few, you know, different versions of how that might have come about, but yeah, but yeah, he was able to hear again. It doesn't just, it just doesn't seem like the good basis of a medical intervention. I kept looking during our, my second quarter of anatomy during head and neck, uh, for the nerve that goes from cervical vertebrae up to the ear and, uh, couldn't find it. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I've got a couple, uh, quick questions for you. Sure. Uh, infectious disease doctor, you, uh, I'm sure have studied a lot of microbiology. That's what I'm in right now and oh. can't wait to get over with it. Well, here, I'll let you know in medical school, I hated microbiology. Yeah. So go figure. I do it for a living kind <laughs> of. So what is your favorite microbe right now? Favorite? Yeah. It's one I can kill, <laughs> um, which is happening less and less. Now I always say that if I was a superhero, my arch enemy would be staph aureus. Mm. Um, because that's the one I try and kill most and have the most problems with professionally. I don't know if you call if you if it's my favorite because it pays my mortgage and and my kid's college tuition, then staff orders would be my favorite. It's my least favorite because it caused the most pain and suffering of everything I see. Mm. If you had to limit yourself to one topic of debate, whether it's homeopathy, vaccines, Reiki, chiropractic, the existence of aliens, if you could only do one, what would you pick? Ah, it's an interesting question. It actually would be, and probably this is not quite right, but uh, all the different cognitive biases. Okay, so focus that's more, on the kind of, uh, on that process of fooling ourselves rather than the yeah. outcomes. If I had to pick one that has the most impact on that, I think people use the most and has the most literature on it, it would be acupuncture. Hmm. It's amazing. Of all, I have all these Google and PubMed alerts set up to send me updates and acupuncture always is heads and tails more than anything uh i think it's because china a lot of them are coming out of china and china is booming with medical and pseudo medical research so i'd probably pick acupuncture as i said i've been listening to quackcast for quite a while but you don't only do quackcast you've no. got you you're an editor for sciencebasedmedicine.org yeah. you write for medline you've got that's medscape medscape sorry You've got the Gabbada Pus blog and podcast. Yeah. And now you've got the Society for Science-Based Medicine that you are helping run. Are you the lead on that? I've been doing, me and Jan, uh, I've been doing the lion's share of the work. Mm -hmm. I wrote the website and been doing most of the blogging, et cetera, on it. Jan's doing, she's a lawyer, uh, uh, Jan Bellamy. She's been doing the legal aspects of this sort of thing. As a student with like 30 hours, 30 credit hours of of load right now, I have trouble just, you know, cooking food. How do you manage all of this, your whole online enterprise? Uh, very poorly. <laughs> but you're I, prolific. I mean, every that, week you've got an article coming out. You've got a podcast uh, quite regularly. I mean, it'll be a weekend where you yeah. release four or five. I have a fair amount of dead time that I always have my P, uh, MacBook Air with. So I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a, um, at work, I, you, when you get a consult, you send the resident off to see it. The resident works them up and comes to you. So I have a, maybe I have an hour to kill while the resident is seeing a patient. So um, if, if I don't have other work to do at the hospital, I'll write something. Um, I don't watch TV anymore. Mm. except for uh, Blazer games. Uh, that's really it. 
I mean, I don't watch television. I have my chair in the living room is sit where I can't see the TV. And when the TV is on, I just sit there and work. And I uh, basically work from when I get up to when I go to sleep. Amazing. It's, pretty, it's fun and I enjoy it, but it just I don't have much dead time. How much do you sleep per night? I usually go to bed at 10.30 and get up between 6 and 7. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah. You're doing better than I am. Oh, uh, you're <laughs> the older you get, the less you can tolerate a lack of sleep. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know how I did it when I was in my twenties. Yeah, I, residency. And oh yeah, those people working eighty-hour weeks and double yeah. shifts. Oh yeah, I, I couldn't do that now. So I just keep busy. You know, what's your inspiration for a blog post? It's amazing. The stuff just sort of comes in if you keep it open. If you keep your filters open, and I have, like I say, I have uh, uh, Google and PubMed um, um, alerts. And then for my infectious disease stuff, it's just what you see every day is mind-bogglingly cool. Mm. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I've been blogging infectious, three times a week in infectious diseases since, I think, 2008. And I almost never, I very rarely have had to repeat myself that much variety. Really? It's really amazing. So yeah. you, don't, you don't ever get bored. Any thoughts on the uh, this spread of a polio-like uh, disease in California that they've determined you know, is not polio? Or yeah, I don't know much. I just know about what I read on a Medscape, so I haven't heard much about it. I'm sure the CDC is all over it, but uh, uh, I haven't. I don't have any extra. I don't have an, uh, any special pipelines into knowledge outside of the internet. Yeah, that's been interesting. We've discussed that a few times in class. Yeah, hopefully they find it something that isn't coming our way. It's what was the uh, what was the inspiration for FSSBM for the Society for Science Based Medicine? Uh, basically, I think that well, not just me, but us and the folks at Science Based Medicine. Basically, that we're an underrepresented how do you want to say cult <laughs> <laughs> we're an underrepresented cult uh in the world i mean if you go to in the in the, in the skeptical world and that stuff there's very little about science-based medicine and there's very few of us who have an interest in it um compare if you take your average you know skeptical inquirer there might be an article harriet hall writes in in the skeptic magazine you'll see harriet's but it's you know bigfoot ufos and kennedy conspiracies and all the the big ones and in medicine most docs are too busy and although the idsa has a lot of interest in vaccines for example they don't have a big thing that i've ever found about combating anti-vaccine issues and so i think there's a void in both organization and uh and focus in this area and so I thought we'd start this in an attempt to have better focus on areas of critical thinking as it applies to medicine. So and it was a... So bringing a group of, of skeptics into science-based medicine. Yeah. Oh, well, more take critical thinking out of our area and into the rest of the world. Mm. Yeah, so, uh, doctors are just horrible to organize, so... Uh, I thought, well, we'll just give it a shot, see what happens. Seems like it's taken off quite a bit. Yes, I'm pleased. I'm. We figured we'd get two or three hundred members in the first two years. I think we got five hundred uh, 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 people, at least five hundred on the uh, who have registered for the website. In a country of three hundred million, eh, we can go farther. But it's very reassuring. <laughs> How many followers do you have on Twitter? I don't know. 600 maybe? Okay. 800, something like that. And do you, do you, do you keep track really? of subscriptions to the podcasts? No, I am very bad at all those sorts of things. I, you know, there's a, you have a choice between producing and consuming. And, and I just tend to throw things out there and forget about them, which is not a good way to do stuff. You have tried for relentless self promotion. Uh, I don't spend, I don't Twitter enough. I, I totally do not get Facebook. Uh, Facebook, 10 tattoos, mark me as uh, an old geezer because I don't understand either of them. 
Uh, and I, you know, I don't do that. So I tend to produce stuff and throw it out there and just let people do what they want. I don't pay enough attention to that stuff. Mm-hmm. Probably and I helps, should. It probably helps keep a sane mind with that yeah. and all that stuff. Um, I spend a lot of time on, on social media, probably more than I should, especially while I'm in grad school. I mean, come on. But I'm on YouTube. I'm reading comments on you know YouTube videos about chiropractic. And I hear a lot uh, people commenting and saying, you know, chiropractic students or chiropractors just have to be incredibly stupid or just shockingly ignorant or just devoid of, scientifically th- of scientific thinking to believe in this stuff. I mean, would you go that far as to say that they're just not intelligent? Uh, no, I think it depends on, like all things, there's great homo- heterogeneity in the field. So I, I, there are those like uh, Sam Homola, that's how you pronounce his name, uh, who um, uh, ha- wants nothing to do with subluxations and, mm-hmm. oh, which energy is it? <sighs> Innate, innate intelligence. intelligence. Yeah, thank you. There's so many different terms for these energies. I can't remember them. Yeah, and he's a chiro- vitalism. Yeah, he's That's a right. chiropractor, and he wants nothing to do with that. Uh, and then there's people who uh, uh, are strongly anti-vaccine and will uh, treat your asthma with chiropractic. Mm-hmm. And there's a great variety. So I, I, you know, we had a friend whose boyfriend was a chiropractor, and he's a nice guy who did reasonable things, and it's variable. Just like they're goofy ass doctors. And they're really good doctors. <laughs> they're all right. You know? Was it, have you seen Doctored, the movie that came out a year or two ago? No. Yeah. I think it's in that one that they have medical doctors talking about, you know, vaccines cause autism and homeopathy is, you know, my preferred prescription. Uh, but, yeah. yeah. It is, I, I appreciate that you say that. It is more of the variety of individuals because when I'm in school and I'm sitting next to classmates, they're incredibly educated. They are yeah. sharp as can be. I mean, I can talk about just about you pro- anything with, you know, within the medical field or chiropractic or whatever it might be. And, and astrophysics, I, you know, pick whatever. And they have a, a pretty solid foundation and, and knowledge in that. And so it's difficult for me to you know, to hear that chiropractors in general must be diluted. I don't think you can do, that's why I said earlier, I don't know why people use alternative medicine. You can, it's what the individual, given individual, I don't think you can speak to chiropractors as a whole as anything. Mm. Because you versus, and I'm sure there's that gullible shit for brains who sits in the back uh, there's certainly, I know them in my world. Um, <laughs> they exist in all fields and all times. Unfortunately, uh, education does not necessarily mean critical thinking and education doesn't necessarily mean you're a good person. Education just means you're educated. And so, um, you know, chiropractors are probably as a, a group that I would enjoy having dinner, uh, individuals that I'd probably have a great time having dinner with and people that I'd want to uh, run away from as fast as I could. And that applies to every group of people I know. As I said earlier, it's not the person from my mind. And I kind of keep this in mind. It's the concepts. It's not the sinner. It's the sin. And there's great variability in human beings. Is evidence-based chiropractic an oxymoron? No. The question is, do you act on the evidence? Mm-hmm. You can have evidence-based. Uh, I will. I probably should have said this at the beginning because Harriet Hall tends to write most of the chiropractic stuff for science-based medicine, and since she's always ahead of me on that, I will tell you. I should have told you this up front. I don't read that stuff as much as I read other areas because Harriet. It's kind of Harriet's. Um, bigger area of interest. And I tend to, for whatever reason, have fallen more into acupuncture. And I tend to be writing a lot about that lately. Um, uh, uh, what was the question? So, oxymoron. Oh, so no. No, the question is, is do you then act on the evidence? And if you got good studies that show something is not effective, do you abandon it? 
that tins in the alternative medicine world tends to be resistant to change on the basis of evidence. Harriet had an article recently where she took an article from somewhere, some chiropractic blog, on the 10 best papers from the past year. Yeah, I remember and, that. Yeah, and she discussed each one of them in detail and, and explained how this one may not have had a large, a large enough sample size, how this one came to a questionable conclusion. Um, and I would agree that it's, it's difficult to do quality chiropractic research. I mean, to get a large sample size to blind patients, that's a challenge. Yeah, you don't need to put the word chiropractic in that sense. It's difficult to do high quality research in everything. Yeah, any kind of and research. It, yeah, and so, you know, if, it's, if people care enough, it's amazing what gets done. Um, um, I just have to be a little obsessed about it. I think quality research is possible in any place that sets their mind to it. I mean, the NCAAM or NCCAM mm -hmm. funds alternative medicine research. Someone comes up in a teaching institution with a good, uh, it's there, it's just hard and difficult, but it's that way for medicine, for anything. Money's tight and research is hard. That's why I don't do it. <laughs> and the money, money, unfortunately, I think is one of the big factors in, in creating a large quality study. And that's what's great about the NCCAM, I think. And yeah. my school has a study that's just wrapping up. We did one on low back pain. We we're currently in the process of doing one on cervicogenic headache. I think I've heard you say, though, that the NCCAM should be absolved. We shouldn't be putting money into alternative therapy research. Well, to date, they've spent, oh, what was the sum? I forget. A serious chunk of change and showed no benefit. Show the, and, you know, they're... they're um, mandate by the congressman was to show that these things were effective. What's his name? Um, the guy who funded it. I'm blanking. I don't know who Harkin. behind it. Harkin. Senator Harkin. He got funding for it with the express purpose that it's supposed to show these things have benefit. Not to show whether or not they work, but to show they did work. And they've not shown anything has worked. From a scientific method viewpoint, isn't that biased already to say you have to show that it works? But yeah, that's why it's a, not a good reason to fund an agency. So if they had come out and say, let's look at whether or not this works yeah. and fund it with that yeah. purpose. Yeah, he was upset they right. because they haven't shown anything works. Yeah. <laughs> well, because it doesn't work. That's life. Hmm. How long has it been funded? <laughs> to my knowledge, have, has it been that long? Uh, less I'd than 10 have, years? I'd have to Google that. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, how, how long does it take for positive results to come out uh you can do most studies in four or five years mm -hmm. if you can get enough patients and write them up uh what's her name eugenie uh Mazeriak, i think her name is she wrote a nice article in skeptical inquirer going through all the funding and results of the nccam in the last year or two unfortunately si just never puts their stuff online so people can read it their old school paper. Mm. Hard to get a hold of. Yeah. Well, I want to wrap it up. I uh, don't want to take too much of your time. I want to give you the chance. Talk to me. Talk to other chiropractic students. What, what would your advice be? <laughs> I don't know. So I... Let's let's uh, let's clarify I mean, this. I mean, I, I think I know what your advice would be to a student who's considering chiropractic. But how about a student that's in chiropractic I school so. right now and, you know, wants to do their best to be evidence-based, to, to practice based on the science? What do you tell them? If I say anything, I think this is true not only of chiropractic students, of anybody, is, is to understand how bad you think to really understand the cognitive biases, confirmation bias, to understand the, all those uh, ways that we find um, um, results where none exist. I mean, it, my favorite article, my epiphany on that was an article in the American Journal of Medicine nah, years ago called Spiraling Empiricism and it was an article on all the different cognitive problems people make medically in infectious diseases 
to make them think they're doing something. And it's a very, it's a classic in my world for bad thinking. If I were to tell anybody, chiropractic student or naturopathic student or medical student, uh, learn how bad you think and apply it to yourself. But most people don't do that. That's the problem that I would hope to fix someday. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. This has really been enjoyable to talk with you. Oh, no problem.